And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Prometheum Games... Mad, mad men behind the Prometheum system, as well as Advent Horizon, back in, back with their um, flirtation with the o, with the OGL, the <laughs> one the one and only Ashram Kane. How you doing today, man? Or tonight? Technically. Uh, tonight, technically, I am doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, so, thank you so much for being will, for being willing to come on. Oh, and. I would say brave the hell of time zones, but the time zone gap isn't that big compared to some other people I've had. Not so bad. It's not so bad. A couple hours. That's nothing. Now, uh, when you've when you've had to deal with um, like like Eastern European time, <laughs> <laughs> like or, or even Central European time for that matter, or Australian time, um, a couple hour difference isn't too isn't too terrible to deal with. No, definitely. And it's not like it's not like hour and it's not like a few hours and change like in so, in some parts of Canada like St. John's Island. <laughs> where for whatever reason they add 15 minutes onto the time zone. You know, it's to get that extra 10 minutes of light out of every day. I get I guess it's <laughs> Times time zones are weird and a couple years ago, they got even weirder when Australia decided to turn its central time zone into two 30-minute time zones. Because even time even um, time zones want to kill you in Australia. Clearly. Clearly. That's... You got spiders, you got river sharks, you got time zones. Now yep. clocks are the enemy. You also got Sydney roads. <laughs> yeah, I would not I would not want to be a bicyclist in, uh, in Australia. Oh. Uh. I pro well, the well, there's also there's also the mag there's also swooping season, which is why it's almost mandatory to wear a helmet during like si during like six months of the year, so you're not dealing with magpies, um, dive bombing you because they will <laughs> they will di they will dive bomb you. It's bet and it's better to have a helmet when they do. <laughs> oh, that's what I've heard. <laughs> it's. Of course, around the same time I found out about that, I, I found out that parts of Tokyo have a crow problem. Yes, yes, the, the, the northern Tokyo crows, they're evil and steely and aggressive. Well, I did, I did a list of the, of the ten biggest assholes in the animal kingdom, and crows are definitely up there. Um, right, right, alongside, like, or, right alongside orcas, zebras... Um, chimpanzees, and of course the honey badger. Honey badger don't give no f's. <laughs> yeah, but which isn't too surprising when you look at its relatives: <laughs> the skunk and the wolverine. <laughs> both both are both are animals that um <laughs> that 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 exude. What what my friend calls crackhead courage. <laughs> That's a remarkably polite way of putting it. I like that. <laughs> but <laughs> a bit of now a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, that's a good question. I I think I first played D and D with my brother and his friends, and this was like, I think like the year the first A D and D book came out, and uh, we we were gathered around the table, and I had no idea what was going on. But uh, stop me if this sounds familiar. And this was way before way before this uh, this uh, this other character existed. But I made a fighter who was focused on fighting monsters. And uh, he carried two swords, carried a long sword, and then he carried a silvered long sword. And, uh, and man, that character sucked. I died like 
three times while we were playing. I had no idea what we were doing. It was super hard. But I loved the concept, this this idea that that I could make this hero and like I could embark on their journey with my friends and I could tell these stories together. And now my brother and his friends were all assholes to me because I was a little kid. And you know, what do you do when you've got a little kid at the table and you don't like him because you're brothers? Of course you treat him like shit. Um, but but the 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 just the joy of making that character and playing that character really, really stuck with me. So, you know, I, I promptly took my brother's AD&D books and Xeroxed the hell out of them and stuck them in a, in a three-ring binder and took that to school with me. And I was like, guys, guys, guys. I got my friends together. I'm like, we're going to play a game where we count stuff and we do math. And they looked at me like I was smoking hashish out of a tailpipe of a, a Buick. And uh, I got them to play eventually because, I mean, you know, at that age, we were... We were, what, eight, nine? You're starved for entertainment. And this was the mountains in Colorado. So, you know, naturally, we were, we were pretty hungry for something to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just it became just a lifelong thing for me. It wasn't, I wouldn't say it was an escape, but it certainly was something that I felt kind of grounded, you know, my reason to have friends, reason to go outside, reason to, you know, not get into trouble with, with everybody else in my neighborhood. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of where it began. Yeah. And I was about, I was about to, I can understand why you said stop me if you've heard this before, because you said two swords, one of them being silvered and and I'm sitting here going, um, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, (laughs) Geralt, but I'm going to. (laughs) Oh no, absolutely. And this was this was before The Witcher and was a dream in 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 the author's eye. And actually, for the record, I love those books now. Um, but I will I will never forget the uh, the how I heard about those books was I was telling this story about my first D and D character, somebody who looked at me just dead eyes like, "So you made The Witcher?" And I'm like, "The water." And he was like was talking about the books and then like that year a video game came out about uh, the witcher the first one from cd project i was like this is just so cool this character is way better than my character mm-hmm. <laughs> and i will n- i will note i i enjoy the books though i don't have i don't have nice things to say about Sapkowski after after his little legal stunt against cdpr uh yeah that was really stu- that was really stupid on his part Oh. That that and if you that end the question of if you don't if you have such disrespect for video games as a storytelling form why were you why why are you working with them <laughs> that's always that's always been a question that's been in the back of my mind but when did you most did you mostly stick with D with D and D or did you jump around between editions? I know before we went live, you had you had talked about your appreciation for the Palladium system and and especially Rifts. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I, I played D and D quite a bit um, until I think I was maybe thirteen or so, um, and I got my hands on. Ed- my first other system was was Rifts, as a matter of fact. It was uh, the, the Palladium Rifts books. And that kind of was a huge change for me because I had, up to this point, I had homebrewed so much crazy stuff for D&D um, that it was, it, was, it was nuts. Like pages upon pages upon pages of stuff that I had made to, to homebrew it. And then this new system came along with these new rules and these new characters. And I realized there were other games besides D and D, and so, so uh, you know, D and D might have been the, the gateway drug to the habit, but uh, but Palladium was definitely the first uh, the first hard drug that I saw <laughs> decided to try, um, and that immediately led to the the Marvel super the old school Marvel superhero game. Marvel I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but oh yeah, the, yeah, face rip, um, and then uh, uh, what was it, Paranoia, and then. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade. After that, um, you were not because there was a soft citizen. role I was super into at the time. <laughs> hmm? Are you unhappy with your clearance, citizen? <laughs> oh my god! Ha! Huh. That brings back memories. But uh, but yeah, no. I uh, as soon as I discovered there were other games out there, I I became 
pretty addicted to a lot of them. And I went out of my way to find new systems and new games to play. And then, you know, started having a book collection of games that I never actually got a chance to play. Like everybody in the industry who, you know, loves it too much. Mm -hmm. And well, in my, in my case, I, ha I certainly have that and I've certainly run plenty of them. It's just, it's just that I, I learned, I learned to, curt I don't have to deal with too many, um, excess shenanigans from players because nobody nobody wants to tempt fate when the GM is taller than everybody. <laughs> I'm 6'6 six, I'm six, six, and, and everybody else is a bunch of 5 foot nothing manlets. <laughs> at, at, at my table at my various tables o over the years. There's also the fact that if if I catch anybody cheating then they have to go through one of the two punishment games. <laughs> Oh. Punishment games. I love this. Option a, option A, you drink. You have to drink a bottle of bacon soda. That's cruel and unusual. Okay. Um. Option B, you drink what's known as the pain glass, which is a shot glass filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, four different hot sauces, and um, and some ground up jalapeno seeds. Cause that just sounds kind of tasty, so you know I I'd probably go with that one personally. Um, It'd be like hook me up with some misery. For the long for the longest time for the longest time, I I would just use off the shelf hot sauces. Then I discovered hot ones, and everybody <laughs> wishes I didn't because I have used that to up the ante when people want to do the pain glass because everybody thinks, oh I I can handle hot stuff, and then and then I d I don't tell them that. There's some go that there's some ghost peppers tear tear stuff in that, or <laughs> or sometimes I'll cra sometimes I'll crack one of those um one of those packy one chip things and put and put that oh, yeah. and put that in the mix, or a drop of insanity <laughs> sauce, which yeah on the label it says you're only supposed to use one drop. A few times I've used the last dab on on the <laughs> the the the. the, the, the I don't have to use it all that often, but the idea was create a punishment that is so much worse than the crime that nobody would want to tempt fate. Classic deterrence. You know, you know the the idea the idea of nope nobody nobody wants to try and do a mutiny a, a mutiny against the captain because if they end up having to get flogged publicly, that's going to be worse than getting shot, or <laughs> or or the whole thing of walking the plank, but. It's it certainly works, and I it was an evolution of when I do, when I'd have game night at my place and we'd all play Goldeneye. We had a rule that if you if you picked odd job after the match, we all get to punch you in the nuts. <laughs> I think two people, two people decided to do it anyways, and they dealt with the punishment because they chose not to they chose not to wear a cup because I guess they didn't think I was serious. <laughs> I said, all right, sta all right, stand up, everybody else, get in line. Every, every, Everybody gets one shot, and I made sure to have him blindfolded so he didn't flinch. Because I had, I had, fi I had figured that, given how much of a pain, if you played Goldeneye back in the day, you know how much of a royal pain odd job is. So mm -hmm. I, fi I figure, match the mental pain with physical pain. Balance things out. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, when t when Tekken three came around, we we had the same kind of rule with it, with anybody picking Eddie because fuck Eddie. <laughs> yeah. No, that was one move spam. Absolute bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like either you were guaranteed to lose like a fool, or you were gonna one move spam that spin and just piss everybody off. Oh God, Eddie. Um. And. Of course, when Brawl came along, I had I had the same thing with Meta Knight, where if you if you picked him, then I am I'm allowed to put you in a chicken wing. <laughs> but now with within within all of that, because because yeah, there's there's plenty there's plenty of um di of different experiences that I I saw with that, and of course of. Uh, now, as I understand it, the first um, product that you had put out was Advent Horizon, which was a space opera using the OGL. 
Um, correct, correct. What made you want to go with a space opera for, the, for that first project? Okay, so there's actually a lot of history behind Advent Horizon. Um, at the time, uh, I had been interviewing with uh, Wizards of the Coast for a role in their design department. Um, and I'd gotten to basically the, the final round um, when somebody who wasn't even in the interview loop um, looked over and said, pass, we're going to hire this other guy instead. And then the, the feedback that I got later uh, was, oh, well, you know, despite, you know, having worked and designed on multiple games and published multiple stuff before, you hadn't written a TTRPG before. Um, you hadn't published a TTRPG before. And so in a pure spite and a fugue fueled by whiskey, uh, I wrote Advent Horizon kind of in a in a in a blitz. Um, I'm a huge sci-fi fan, mm -hmm. and I felt that you know the five E rules left a lot to be desired in terms of of things. And there were some other modern takes on the five E uh, OGL, but none of them I don't know none of them solved the problems that I felt that the uh, the OGL had with sci-fi or even modern uh, games. Um, and I wanted to correct that and kind of prove that I could sort of sort of way. So um, I spent about six months uh, writing it and then about two months doing the layout design and, and published it that year um, right after the, uh, the the interview, just kind of as a as an FU to a select few people. Um, as for why sci-fi, I'm just a huge fan of sci-fi. I think that sci-fi in, in RPGs gets woefully up, underrepresented and a lot of times it gets replaced with sci-fantasy. Right, so you don't get to be scientists and engineers in space. You get to be space wizards, right? And I, I hate that. Uh, so my, my, my big pet peeve about sci-fi is when there's very little science in, invited to the party. Oh, you probably love um, Traveler. I do like Traveler. I'm actually a big fan of Traveler. I just, you know, I wanted to do something that was my own, something that had a, a bit of my own story to tell in it. Yeah, I... I can understand that. I, I, um, I've had I've had my complications with the way with the way people treat science science fiction. Um, I do think I do think that some that some aspects, especially the harder aspects, are going to be difficult to br difficult to bring people in who are not as technically inclined. Um, I, that is very true. Um, I've covered. I've covered both Traveler Five and Mongoose Traveler Second, um, which for the longest time I said I wouldn't because I was afraid I was going to have to find a way to summarize all the system <laughs> that Traveler has done over over the pa over the past forty years. Um, but I will I will note the that between the between the two I th I actually prefer the Mongoose version. As opposed to Traveler Five, because Traveler Five decided to write itself in far too technical of a way to the point where it actually interfered with getting information quickly. Yes, I I I, 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 I can described agree with that. it as it re it reads like it reads like the owner's manual to your car that you don't read. <laughs> yes, that includes you. Nobody nobody reads the owner's manual whether they get a car new or used. Nobody reads that thing. <laughs> I I feel like such an outlier because I actually read all of the manuals to my cars, but I had to teach myself to drive. So like that's kind of one of the things you need to learn when you when you didn't have driver's ed. Well, if I can't use <laughs> if I can't use that, I'll bring up that gi that giant manual that came with the TI eighty three we all got in high school. Oh no, that I never read. No, hell of that. No, nobody <laughs> nobody reads that. I still ha I still have it on my shelf. I've never opened it up, <laughs> but. The the point is, is that it is that it's is that when when you the peop the people who probably have an engineer or or engineering background would probably probably love that approach. Although given what I've heard about the development of Traveler Five, I can't say that's the case. But there comes a time where you where where you can't you can't do that level of technical. You have to focus on what people are actually going to be using to play the damn game, and remember that. This is not trying to be a simulation of of a of a scientific endeavor. This is still a game. Fun first. Uh, but 
obvious, obviously, th obviously, then there, w then the whole OGL thing went down. You and I, t you and I had a bit of a discussion on that before we went live. But was the Prometheum system something that you had always planned on sh on shifting towards, or was it a case where the OGL fiasco accelerated things? Um, you know, we actually came came out um, with uh, with Curse Brand before the OGL fiasco, and um, you know, the the truth of the matter is that I had always wanted to do my own system. Um, and I had actually been working on my own system for some time um, before uh, before Advent. But in writing Advent, um, where I had to take and rewrite the entire OGL and all of the rules for the OGL um, in my own copyrightable language, um, I had an epiphany about the balance between simplicity and layout and strongly typed versus loosely typed um, mechanics and data structures for the game. And, you know, something really clicked, and I had a, a realization when we were playtesting Advent with, uh, with one of my friend's kids. Um, he, you know, he, he got through, you know, the first session, and he looked at me really deadpan. And this is a kid who just was really into, you know, uh, sci-fi and adventure and stuff like that. And, and he said, this math game is boring. And I was like, oh, no, it was like, is your character boring? Or is, is, is you know, the, the class, was the adventure boring? He was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun playing with, with you all. I, I had a lot of fun making my character and hearing the story about my character and playing my character. But the math game was boring. And then it hit me. He was talking about the raw mechanics of the system itself. And so I broke it down. Could the raw mechanics of the systems of 5e ever be fun the simple answer is they're not right like if you take away the swords the sorcery the flavor of the language if you just play the game of d20 versus number and then you don't have flavor you just have numbers that you manage to get it's boring right it's mechanically boring and at that moment I think that everything kind of coalesced. And I took the old system that I'd been working on for years and years and years and years and years. And it was boring. And it was uh, just the rules alone were like 350 pages. It was ridiculous. It was like 250,000 word count. Um, and I took the things that were great about it and I scrapped the rest. And I sat down and I said, okay, what's fun? What would be fun mechanically? What mechanics devoid of the flavor would be fun to engage with. And so we went through a couple of iterations and I, I took an approach very much like video game design. Um, and, you know, I tried to look at it outside of the story, outside of any of the things to be connected to it. What would be viscerally fun to engage with at the table? How do I turn numbers and math the game into fun? And, um, we went through a couple of more play tests and uh, I was sitting and I was talking with my wife and she said, the only thing that I enjoyed in D&D was when I cast Fireball and I used a fistful of dice. And then it hit me. Everybody that I had talked to and I had played with really loved Legend of the Five Rings and having all of those dice. They didn't like the complicated stuff that came after that, but they really loved rolling a bunch of dice. And so that's when I kind of was like, okay, I can balance that. That is, that is a system that I can balance. Um, and so that's kind of where it all kind of coalesced and came together. And I, I designed up the, the Prometheum system around the idea of making the core mechanics, the activity at the table, fun and fun to engage with. Mm -hmm. Now, is it a case where Curse Brain Chron Chronicles came first and then Epic Age? Which, which was the chicken? Which was the egg? Oh, um, actually, Epic Age. Epic Age predates Curse Brand by years. Um, Epic Age is a descendant of one of my original D and D worlds, um, which you know had had blossomed and kind of taken on its own lore and world and, and story and everything. Um, and uh, well, that's that's kind of not true. So, Curse Brand is a direct descendant of a game that I. Uh, created in college uh, with my with my college buddies um, to play. So there, 
both of them are like outside of the the Promethean rule set, like the lore and the story and the, and the history and the items there. All of those are pretty old. I mean, they, they both go back, you know, <laughs> I want to say 15 years. Um, the first one that we did that we published was Curse Brand because I had less, I don't know, less to, to say about that one. It didn't need to be as perfect as I needed Epic Age to be because Epic Age had a lot more story personally involved in it. And there was a lot more that I wanted to to, to say in Epic Age. Mm-hmm. And then there was another piece of that that I have a big um, cosmology and chronology that I want to use to connect all of the Promethean games together with. Um, and so I wanted to have that really refined before I did Epic Age because Epic Age is the first one that really hints at it. You know, it hints at the nature of gods. It hints at the nature of, of cosmic entities. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that all of the stuff that was going to go into it, all of the hints and Easter eggs were, were really refined. Um, Curse Brand has a lot too. Um, and o- objectively, the world of Curse Brand Gestalt has a more, uh, has as much lore and impact on the, the, the large meta lore and meta history uh, as Epic Age. Um, but it's a little bit different in that I there's more room where I don't really necessarily care. And so having somebody else work on it wouldn't be as big an issue. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, with, with, um, with curse brand, I'm I'm curious what some of the bits of media and the like were inspirations or you, or you used as touchstones or, or the like, what is curse brands appendix N essentially? Yeah, that is a tough question. Um, so really, there's kind of three major inspiration points for Curse Brand um, in terms of like how I approach like, uh, the mechanics and some of, some of the lore structure. Um, the first is um, an old anime called Escaflone. I'm familiar uh, with Escaflone. Yeah, so there's, there's a certain... Thing that I like about it. I don't know what to call it. I don't, I don't know what the word for it is, but there's something that I, I really wanted to capture from that, a certain something. Um, and then, obviously, you know, I really loved uh, Final Fantasy VII always, and the mechanics for Lens were greatly inspired by Materia, obviously. But they were also inspired by another game that had a similar mechanism um, that was in the... Um, uh, God, what was it? The Tales of Destiny? No, what was it? Um, yeah, actually, I think it was Tales of Destiny. It was a it was a PlayStation JRPG that had a very similar kind of mechanic, and I, I drew very heavily from that one as well. Um, and, and lastly, there was a there was an anime called Garo Vanishing Line, I think it was called. It had this incredible fantasy postmodern story that I really wanted to connect, and so. Like, I wanted to have this theme of, like, diesel punk. Like, modern, but not, like, what we think of as modern, not, like, high technology. Um, and I wanted to have that really strong Magitech feel to it, right? Which Because I, I love that, and I don't think there's enough games that do that where they really commit to it being, you know, industrial. You know, it's always, like, steampunk, right? It's always, like, magic and steampunk. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But it's been done, Right. Um, you know the, the 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 sense that I wanted to get was a little bit more visceral. I wanted to have that that World War II feel, you know, um, and really connect that to the kind of Magitech feeling. Mm-hmm. I I can I can certainly get that, and um, I have a bit of a history with Ga- with Garo, though it though it's more it's more with the live action garo rather than the animated stuff which the live action can't, can't it's it's the reason why I, I always bring up the live action stuff when it came to garo is aside from the fact that that came first he um, did Ga- that was made by an by very much an all-star team when it came to mm-hmm. togusats and <laughs> i love i love throwing th- i love throwing that series at people whenever they tell me that Togusats is too is too silly to be taken seriously. Oh. <laughs> the Garo series, like they, especially like the 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 the, uh, the earlier, well, not earlier, like the mid midpoint live action stuff, they do some 
there's some dark stuff there. Like it, they've got gravitas. Well, it's important. It's it's important to um t- to keep in mind who was who was involved with the or, with the original um production. Um, and that that being the original tw- the original twenty five episodes, what's called the chapter of the Black Wolf. Oh, uh, because there, because there's there's you have you have um the fact that it was made by Keita Amamiya, who <laughs> has stuff like Zeram and and Kamen Rider Zeto un, under his belt, but yeah, he also Keita well, has a stuff. very has a very unique um visual style, and has has been responsible for a lot of character designs through a lot of different media, um. Whether whether that be whether that be um the stuff he did for Oni for Onimusha two whether it be the stuff that was done for Genji or or even the hidden gem that is Hagane back on the SNES. <laughs> um, there was there was also um yes between him Yasushi Nirasawa Kenjo. Kengo Kaiji and Makoto, and Makoto Yoko, Yokoyama. Um, you had a, you had a lot of very very experienced people in Tokusatsu, and Nirosawa especially, who has done has done a lot of a lot of work when it comes to monster designs. Mm, yeah. You know, whether, whether it be Kamen Rider, whether it be Super Sentai, whether it be Giver or Inazuman, um, there's been a, there's been a lot of stuff that they, that they've done, and defines the the look and feel for like Sentai esque monsters. Like whether he wanted to or not, like that that genre for monsters became the trope. Like, and it was directly from him. So, well, a lot. A lot of the a lot of the the patient zero for both for both Kamen Rider and Super Sentai is the same guy. That being Shotaro Ishinomori, and if you go back and look at a lot of the manga that he did, there's always been a tinge of horror to it. Yeah. Um. Whether it, I'd, whether it be whether it be some of the darker some of the darker, imp, um, implied aspects in Cyborg Zero Zero Nine. Or the stuff he was doing with the Skull Man, which would la- which later lay the groundwork for Common Rider. Uh, and the the Skull Man is technically speaking the first anti-hero in comics. Yeah. It's it, you you end up having an you end up having an interesting um, lineage, and I can de- I can definitely see the um, dice goblinness, although. Even it's funny you mentioned L five R, which is another game that I am I'm very fond of, but it's but it's not what I consider the true king of Dice Goblin. That unfortunately oh, still goes to Shadowrun. Yeah, Sh- Shadowrun with your your pools and your uh, massive collections sitting all divided up on your on your table. Yeah, Shadowrun was ah, uh, you know, I loved the world and the story in Shadowrun. But man, I had a hell of a time playing it. <laughs> Shadowrun is a game that is full that is full of traps, and I'm guess and one of them is the fact that it acts like it's a class based game, but it really isn't. You no, it's totally a skill based game. And, good. Types, and the bigger problem it and this is a this is a problem I have with a lot of games that rose to prominence in the nineties. Too many skills. Too many skills, oh, too many sub skills. Granted, Shadowrun's not the worst offender to that. I'd I'd say some of those fantasy games, unlimited games, are far worse in ter- in terms of that. And Phoenix Command is one of my whipping boys because I've outright stated I will not run Phoenix <laughs> Command again unless I'm paid. Not in a paid GM thing. No, no, it's to no, it's to pay my shrink. <laughs> I'm torn because you know from from one perspective I love lots of character options right I think that's something that, that players like 
and it adds a lot of flavor for you know your your game but yeah like when you've got you know one of the things that i will give a uh, 5e um that i i i hated when i first played when i first made a character for 5e was the proficiency system but the general idea that a character can do and can attempt anything right regardless of the knowledge that they have so long as they know the action exists there's a reasonable chance they can attempt it there's not a chance they'll succeed um i i liked that and i i thought that was really potent um you know, rather than codifying every single minuscule specialty and skill um that a person could have you know rather categorizing it into to broad circles of knowledge and capability that's a smart play it's good design i mean say what you will about any of the other stuff i think that was good design from a both a, a gm standpoint you know personally running it it's much easier um and a character standpoint because you know suddenly there's a list of these circles of action that you can take on on your character sheet and you can look at them you can kind of understand what you're going to be able to do which is why i think it it became very accessible for people whereas you know a lot of those games from the 90s like you said you know i love riffs i love the plating games but man i had to homebrew new skill systems every time everybody has because i could riffs yeah right <laughs> <laughs> best best training for RPG design: homebrewing riffs so you can actually play it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I had I think the last time I did riffs, I had a, I had a home I had a um, homebrew booklet that was twenty five pages just of different notes. Uh, there's that sounds about right. But the big reason why a lot of a lot of those mass a, a lot of those massive skill lists don't don't work for me is. You is um in part you end you end up having a sunk cost fal sunk cost fallacy effect where you're where you're almost disinclined to pick up new skills because you have to have those skills play catch up, and as as fun the and this is where I end up being a bit of a heretic because that whole proficiency thing, while I like it while I'm while I'm all right with it, um. It was done better in the game that everybody told tell every the addition that everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because they don't pay me. Um, <laughs> because both Star Wars Saga Edition and then D and D Fourth Edition had that had a similar um, yes. gra gradual upscaling that was half level, as opposed to that same upscaling, but you only get it if you're prof if you're proficient that 5e decided to do because when i 5e was billed to me as a uniting of the editions yeah. and well as and and i and while a lot of people forget this it one of the um one of the repeated phrases i was hearing in the first year of its release was a greatest hits of the of previous editions Just in several <laughs> of those cases it was doing thing. It was it was doing things from previous editions, but it didn't seem to get the point. <laughs> the, that sounds about right. Like I, I remember people telling me that the hit that the hit dice in Five E was a was a perfect spiritual pre successor to the healing surges in Fourth. Anyone who says that never never played Fourth and doesn't know how the healing surges were supposed to work. Yeah. No. Healing surges yeah, when they were introduced in fourth, and I have I have direct testimony on this. The reason they were introduced was to try and address the heal bot problem. Yep. That that idea that you needed to have a cleric who was just gonna who was just going to heal the party, and li and little else give the, give other players a healing option. That was the intent. You can't. Re one could argue one could argue you can do that with with second win but the amount of healing you get from that or get from hit dice one is a gamble and two is so is so minuscule as to kind of defeat the purpose <clears throat> the other the other big case of missing the point that i often bring up is the idea of feats being an alternative to asi oh my god yeah that is an absolute killer for me i can't i yeah, yeah. Because when feats were introduced, 
And I, I see them as kind of an evolution of the proficiency thing that was introduced in the tail end of AD&D 2nd, but didn't have enough, didn't really have enough time to cook. Oh. I mean, it, it reached critical mass in the skills and powers AD&D era, and that was kind of where it went to die. Although I put I put a lot I put a lot of that on um, on the on the Lady of Pain being an idiot, but that's another story. <clears throat> A.K.A. A.K.A. A. A. Williams, the per the person the person who thought, hey let's let's do a buck let's do a Buck Rogers game in 1986. Nothing could possibly go wrong. <laughs> who the hell was going to know uh, who Buck Rogers was in '86? <sighs> I mean, there are some there are some franchises that last, you know, that have that staying power. Buck Rogers was certainly not one of them. <laughs> I know that there was the I know that there was the Saturday morning cartoon in the late seventies, but by nineteen eighty six, Star um Star Wars and and Star Trek had more, had dominated the science fiction sp space when it came to pop culture. Completely. Oh. I mean, you could you could argue, you know, eighty six. You could argue a little bit for maybe Battlestar Galactica if you really, really wanted to. Yeah, uh, that's but a, that that's complicated. Yeah, that's a whole separate can of worms regarding you know, good gonna, versus bad decisions. I'm gonna need another keg if I go if I have to go into Battlestar Galactica's <laughs> or, or, um, kerfluffus, but. <laughs> But the point the point is is that feats were introduced as a way to for, to allow for further customization beyond just your choice of race and class. Now, granted, I will admit that the feats in third edition got way out of hand. But the, beautifully, but... beautifully out of hand. Just admit it. You know you loved it. The cornucopia of non-comparable mechanics that were impossible to balance and required hours to look up as a GM just to understand why the one Gish character was owning the table. Yeah, you know you loved it. I blame all that on <laughs> Cook. <laughs> yes. <'Cause> he... <laughs> Monty absolutely destroyed it with that. It's all his fault. <laughs> because he he was doing that whole system mastery should be encouraged and system ignorance should be punished, that ivory tower shit that he rightfully got shit on for. <laughs> Even one of my acquaintances called called him out in front of everybody over it. This is totally his, uh, his absolute belief that like the system should be inscrutable and impenetrable, and if you were not a master of the book... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, I'm... I'm pretty sh I'm I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that if I that if I was in the same room with him around around that time I probably would have caused a scene because my, <laughs> I've had I've had the strong belief that every game is someone's first and yep the big problem that I have with say the long skill list of those games in the 90s or a lot or a lot of the feat combinations in in say third edition or or similar affairs is I don't like traps yeah, yeah. And there's way too. And furthermore, I don't like the concept of false choice. Yeah. Oh, that's a big one for me. Um, and if you look at the the Promethean system, is entirely built around it, absolutely destroying the concept of false choice. Like yeah. every choice you make has to have a lot of meaning, and it. Eh, yeah. Yeah, and. One of the things, one of the things within it that I found very, in, that I found very interesting, is you is your use of a a tree system when it came to both skill development and the development of classes. In a in a way that you do, that um you don't see all that often because a lot of people look at that particular that particular setup, they think they think video games and then they start screeching. Because apparently we're not supposed to take inspiration from video games for reasons I do not understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a lot of uh, old school gamers give me that kind of feedback. And, you know, the funny thing that I like to say is that um, we play tested with a lot of kids, uh, a lot of younger kids, you know, nine to 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. And they got the system instantly. They understood, you know, you show them the, the, the skill table and they understood that it was a path 
for them to upgrade and that it was their choice on how they wanted to upgrade and how they wanted to play any particular class. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, yeah, that's from video games. Why? Because I have a background in video games, right? I have a background in, in video games and software. Um, and that doesn't make anything uh, particularly worse, I guarantee you. Um, and truth be, to- truth be told, when it comes to it, it's mo- the video game thing is mostly me taking the piss because <laughs> um, a lot of the... I, I had... It, when 4th edition came out, I had to deal with no end of people claiming that it played like an MMO. And then I then I asked them, okay, sandbox or theme park style MMO? And they look at me like I got turds hanging out of my mouth. Right. Because, because there is- it, was very, it was very clear to me that a lot of the people making the argument did not have a very strong understanding of, MM, of MMO design. And we're just using that as a um, cudgel. There is, and then, there is. I will. I will not deny that there is, that there are some elements of cross in, of cross inspiration. However, the issue the issue that I've often had is this idea is this um designed by gospel idea of what you're supposed to be drawing inspiration from, especially since everybody conveniently forgot that. There were plenty of articles when back in 2000 when 3rd edition came out where people were saying that it was trying to turn D&D into Diablo. D&D into a video game. And then, oh, God help us, when the actual 3rd ed Diablo book came out, everyone was like, oh, see, this is the proof. This is, this is video games are ruining our, our tabletop I have, games. I have to correct you on one thing. There was an AD and D second book on d- that used. D- oh, was there? Yeah. It, oh it man, I must have missed that one. It wasn't one. third edition. It was AD and D second. There was oh, a my World Lord. of Warcraft uh, book that used third edition, but that wasn't done by Wizards. That was done by um, Sword and Sorcery, which was the D twenty imprint of White Wolf at the time. Yes, that I remember. And. Everybody conveniently for, forgets that, and it, it wasn't like it was a fly by night thing. There were, all there were there were full on, um, but there were full on packages of stuff of stuff in the in that for, in that format. In in a it was AD and D second edition. I remember bec- I can always tell because of the way the logo is set is set up. That's always a telltale sign. It what it um there there were se- there were several um supplements. It was meant to be this standalone thing that ha- that could that could be cross compatible, and it's and it's one of those it's one of those things that people um, forget. In, in particular, I do have to correct myself. The AD and D second edition stuff was Diablo two. The for and I and take keep keep in mind this all of this is with a with a grain of salt because it's been quite a it's been quite a while. <laughs> but and yet and actually yeah I do have to correct myself it was AD and D second edition mainly and I just I don't have I don't have the, I don't have the same amount of scans that I that I used to on that front. <laughs> The the two main ones that that I have are the Awakening and the Secret Cow level. Because oh of my course, goodness! Because of course they had to, they had to make that joke. Oh, but yeah. now Grant now gr- and the funny th- and the funny thing is is that that w- that particular um that particular Diablo two module. Was was made by Cordell, um, Cordell and and Selinker were responsible for that one. Yeah. And it's there's oh, and of course whenever whenever the video game thing gets brought up, everybody conveniently forgets about the history of SSI. You know the fact the fact that th- that under the SSI brand there were a lot of D and D video games. Yes, there were. I mean, and it's not just the 
a lot of the early video games themselves were really strongly inspired by D D. Like this there, is an absolute the, like there was a D and D um program on the old Plato servers back in the seventies. Like the first the first MUDs, you know, were generally D D MUDs, either G D themed or like straight up plagiarism. Um and that's not a bad thing. Like I don't see I don't see why it's such a such a sin to take something and it's like why can't you be inspired by video games? Why does it have to be novels or, or mythology? You know, these are video games are the collective stories of a whole new generation. Why is Tome it bad to connect them? Do you hmm? remember Tome of Battle? Oh, Jesus, I haven't thought about that in 20 years. <laughs> I, I remember saying right around the time that it came out, because people, because people were raising a stink about that and it drawing upon... Um, Thing, and drawing upon things like things like anime and and manga and video games and I'm like you're going to be having a whole generation who did not get their start through reading Moorcock or through reading Howard or Le or Lieber or or any of the any of those classical approved high fantasy authors maybe they got their introduction through through fantasy through cartoons like King Arthur and the Knights of Justice or shows like Hercules Maybe they got their ins their introduction through anime like Record of Lodos War or The Slayers, or even through. Oh, and that's just it. Like, uh, that's actually a really good example. Uh, Lodos War. Uh, thinking about it, you know, uh, when I got the the first English subversion of Lotus War, this was, uh, you know, the '90s, and you know, I was so freaking in love with that, right? Like, that totally flavored a lot of the first games that I ran for my friends. It was absolutely Lotus War-themed. And, yeah, Lotus War was built on a on a D and d replay that they, wa that, um, they wanted to make an official D&D &D thing, but TSR mm -hmm. was not exactly the most cooperative. Um, they didn't understand how licensing worked at the time. <laughs> yeah, because... The, and... This wasn't an isolated case because that because that same inability to play ball was what was what caused the German translation to fall through, and thus the Dark Eye was made. And the Dark Eye is objectively a fantastic game. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Schwartz. It's just I love it. Um, I played while I was overseas. I played the Dark Eye for the first time. Um, and they were so nice. They translated everything for me as we were playing. And so, like, like half the time they'd slip into German as we were playing, and I was just totally lost. And so I made a, I made a character who didn't speak the common language, and that was the joke. <laughs> so I was totally role playing, not being able to understand. Oh, it was, it was good times. It was good times. But I think one, I think one of, since we're talking about the, since we're talking about this whole thing of. Um, issues with D and D be, being so, being something of an impetus for the for the way Prometheum w was born. Um, I'd I'd like to talk I'd like to talk a bit about the the way you handle ma the way you handle magic, whether it be th whether it be through magic in Curse Brand and the and thus subsequently the whole miasma thing, or the way you handle it in Epic Age. The f I am always appreciative. When I see a when I see a monopoint system, as opposed to the Vancian model, because I've never ever liked the Vancian model. I didn't like it when I started as a ten year old kid, and I've at best I only tolerate it. Uh, I mean, as much as I realized that it was the closest thing, I, I mean, if you look at the, the origins of the game and looking at it as a tabletop war game, sure it makes sense, but we're past that and. You know, one of the things that I wanted for not just the magic system, but for all of the core interactive systems were for it to be about resource management, mm -hmm. right? You know, letting letting you understand and count and control your resources. Um, I, I like 4E's simplicity approach to, you know, their AED. at will daily encounter. Utility. I thought it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was good, but it took away from the... I want to store up all my all, and I want to have one big shot. And that's something that I really wanted to ca capture. Um, plus, you know, for all its faults, one of the things that I really did love about playing Palladium games was the resource management. It was one of the one things that I thought was a really fun way to 
engage with the the capability of my characters and also to run you know it was a really good way for me to to control the capability of the players and you know control the battlefield for them yeah and when it comes when it comes to that whole storing up for one big thing i th i think um i think the designers with, with during the 4e era started to get it right around the time that psionics were introduced in player's handbook 3 because uh, yeah. of, because of the waste did you ever did you ever play any of the psychic characters in in 4e I did. They... One, my very first 4E character, in fact, was a psychic, yes. Because the way that they handled the AEDU approach was certainly different. It the... was. Uh, and it was a lot more fun, in my opinion. The whole, the whole thing was, aside from utility powers, Scion, whether it be, whether it be Scions, whether it be Ardents, the, on, the only Psionic class that's the exception to this is Monk, which was always kind of weird that that was treated as a psychic class, but I'll, but that's another story. They don't get encounter powers. Instead, you had the um, psychic points that acted as your encounter powers, and you use the. But in return, you got more at wills than anybody, and could customize those at wills using those points. And I do, th given how the given how the proper designer of for, of four E, which was Heinzo, I know, I know. Yeah. I know I know that Merle's likes likes to try and claim like to claim, claim credit but if I'm being honest like Merle strikes me as the th as the third wheel in just about anything he's involved in but he I think when I think when Heinzo um was deci decided to co-create 13th age I think I think that he understood that that whole concept of doubling down on resources because of how a lot of the class design worked in that project. Yeah, I would agree. Especially since Thirteenth Age was meant to be this marriage of ideas between Third and Fourth Edition. And there's some things like particularly the character customization that I think Thirteenth Age excels at. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still feel like there's a few too many non-comparables, but. Whatever players like it, it people like it. I've had fun with Thirteenth Age, so I'm not going to diss it. I I have, and it pro it probably has my favorite incarnation of bards. Oh, I mean, I, yeah. I like I like the I liked Fourth Edition's ver version. I just I just like Thirteenth Age's version a lot more. Um, I will I will. And I I will admit part of the reason is I don't think Bard I don't think Bards or their equivalent should have to double down on the whole instrument thing because that's not that's not the point of a Bard in my opinion. The point of a Bard should be s storytelling, and Fourth Edition brought in this idea of their spell casting is drawn up is drawn upon from that storytelling. I love that concept and that has always been like if you if you read the skeleton in epic age it is very clear that you know what i what i wanted to capture was the the historical concept of the of the storyteller and the orator yeah. um and you know to make the, the power of speech not a not a joke class you know uh which is something that i've seen done i hadn't seen it done well um i definitely wanted to take my own uh, take on it but i do think that uh with the with the thirteenth age, you know, incarnation of their um, their bard class, uh, they they got there. They got there. Um, I think it was it was hampered a little bit by a system that kind of put a lot of emphasis on combat, um, which always makes me a little bit sad. But it wasn't. It was certainly not. You know, compared to the the five e bard, which is basically just a just another you know, half rolling caster. buff. Yeah, just another rolling half caster buffer like yeah at least it wasn't that <laughs> like if you the the only the only half caster in in fifth edition that i find remotely interesting is the warlock and, that, and uh, that's because that's because it's the only one of them that ha that uses 
the spell uses the sandbox of that spell casting in a unique way. Right. I my biggest complaint about the warlock is always going to be the like the reversion to the the version of warlock that appeared in the uh, skills and or spells and magic. Uh, skills and powers AD&D module with the the borrowed power thing. That was always my biggest complaint from a narrative perspective. It's such a silly quibble that I have, but it always bothered me. Um, you know, with it, with the, the iteration uh, in Forthy and the, the the bringing back this 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 you know your your um, your pact and that's where you get power from. I get it, I get it, but it's always been my complaint. Mechanically, it's always been the funnest class to me. Like the spell casting mechanism, that's always a little bit different, a little bit unique. It's you're not a full caster, um, but you get a little bit of that magic power, and it's not as like overdone, and you have to like manage the resource of it a little bit better. I always thought that was so much more fun, and they had potential to do that with the sorcerer, but instead, the sorcerer, you just you're just a wizard with some points, you know. And I never, I never. I never got the logic of ta- of taking meta magic and giving it just to the just to the sorcerer. I've I had arg- I'd argued that if you if you want to really ha- if you want to really go far with it, a class like a sorcerer should not have defined spells. Exactly, it should have a, a suite of mechanics that you can mix and match based on oh maybe a resource um, that then can produce a variety of strongly typed effects. Like, that is how you do a... Not that I'm working on something like that or anything, but that's how you do a sorcerer. Yeah. Like, I've... I've... And in the, in the same in the same vein, um, some... I've, I've often... I've, I've never really cared for the, for this whole thing of, of fighters shouldn't be, shouldn't be powerful kind of set up when... This is the reason why I brought up Toma Battle, because everybody... Was saying that that was stepping on the toes of casters, even though casters are stepping on everybody's fucking toes as it is. Right, like you're a D and D caster, you're basically a utility knife that does everything all of the time. And if not everyone is a utility knife, then it's not. It again, a non comparable. It's a bunch of you know non comparable systems where, uh, yeah. And then, like, of course, in 5e, everyone has a cantrip, so everyone's got that magical ranged attack, so there's no point in having things that are resistant to uh, normal weapons. Like, well, frustrating. What was annoying for me was, what's the point of having a rogue in the party if you can have the wizard cast knock? Yep. <laughs> you know, the, it's it was hypocritical to me to complain about to complain about martial characters who, for years, have had the short end of the stick. Because they because they're treated as one trick ponies and then later on dip classes. Got to got to dip to get that armor. <laughs> to to say to say when the when the when a lot of a lot of casters and a lot of spell lists have spells that com, that completely undermine not only not only other character archetypes but even the GM's narrative control. Oh. That's the one that really got me about spellcasters, particularly in three five. Um, spellcasters became the bane of doing encounter design. You know, suddenly, you know, the warlock has unlimited flight. The wizard's got you know blinking teleports everywhere. The the cleric is sitting behind four impenetrable shields, and like suddenly, you know, the fighter and thief are dead in the first two rounds because I'm having to scale the encounter for these, you know, these three absolute utility knife monsters. It was frustrating, you know, and I I think that it's, it's cheap design because it doesn't take into the whole picture. Right. You know, it's not, it's balanced, but it's not fair. And those are two very different things. Oh, Which is which is why it's which is why it's funny when I see John Wick talking about how balance is un- is unnecessary. Yet he was responsible for some of the most broken void spells during his tenure with L five R. I know. <laughs> Worst part is he created a bunch of uh, a bunch of of uh, disadvantages in L five R that were totally just advantages. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a case of don't throw stones in that glass house. I, I I like Wick, but he's also kind of an asshole. <laughs> and again, so am I. So who am I to judge? But the th- the thing the thing is 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 that with 
with the Prometheum system, what I see out of that is in is addr addressing that by giving things like martial techniques or giving the resource management, um, so th so that ev so that everybody has some way to sh way to shine in a given situation. And I think this was one of the really important things for me because again, you know, I'm going to go back to playtesting with kids because you know we we we're, we're all grow ups. We know it. We can be as gravitas and, and as cynical as we want, but at the end of the day, fun is what matters, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what we found was what was fun was when you know you had to count your things but you could do a lot of different stuff and when you know when you're a fighter and you know we we had a we had a kid wanting to describe the the way that they were going to use their their sword to slide behind the enemy and and hit them in the the back of the legs and i was like yeah okay that's that's a technique here i'll, I'll tell you exactly what that's going to cost you 10 vigor right and you're going to use up your your movement Right, and you're gonna you're gonna end up behind them, and you're gonna get an attack that you know is potentially gonna reduce their movement. And suddenly, you know, the the fighters were deeply engaged with combat. And with a resource management game like this, combat's a little bit slower. You know, it's not like D and D where the combat runs go comparatively fast. Um, you know, with the exception of when you've got that one action economy asshole who's taking forty five actions. Um, you know, even though you've got two, potentially three or four actions in the Prometheum system, it takes a little bit longer because you you decide on what you're going to do, you know, you make your roll, it's potentially contested, you know, people can dodge and deflect and, and do all of that stuff, and then it's resolved. And so it slows it down slightly, but everybody's a lot more engaged during those moments. And because, you know, other players are looking at, you know, what status or what effects or what things are going to happen um, to the to the enemies, and so they're kind of paying attention to what the other players are doing, um, and the players themselves are deeply invested in the individual actions they can take because it's it's generally not I'm going to hit it with my sword. Yes, that's an option. You know, we've all had those players who are just you know they're on their phone, they don't want to be that engaged. So having that option is important. But you know, for everybody else at the table, you know, there's that I'm gonna you know even if I don't have any more vigor, I can use um, chances right to make a called shot maybe for extra damage and really make it count so you know having that that ability to keep everybody really focused um so that you know spellcasters are the only ones with a resource that can do something flashy that's just that gets frustrating that gets frustrating for everybody because there's a lot of other situations besides um you know besides combat where that's where i wanted casters and the non-combat classes to really shine basically i didn't want you know uh, magic to be the be all end all for for combat. There's there's also some, this whole idea of wizards have to be the be all end all ends up um, creating a disconnect. And this is a scenario that I've ha that I've had my fair share of times, and I'm pretty sure you've I'm pretty sure you've had this scenario, or at least something like it. So consider consider this. Suppose that suppose that somebody well comes in they're a big fan of let's let's go with pirates of the caribbean for for this you know really really liking a lot of the a lot of these swashbuckling scenes in the in those movies and they and they want to make a character who's a who's a fighter who's a very very good swordsman to the point where they can hold their own against multiple opponents and you and they have it in their head that they're that they're going to be doing all sorts of do all sorts of dodges, all sorts of rolls, all sorts of parries, rep all all of that, all of that stuff that's standard fare to anybody who's even taken a five second lesson in fencing. Yeah. And then they build up their character in D and D, and all that they're able to do is just basic attack. That's I think you're being generous. You know, that's assuming it hits, which you know your first character, your level one character in D and D probably isn't going to do that. There seems to be this idea. There seems to be this idea that, and I've seen some people defend it by say, by saying you're supposed to be you're supposed to be just a bottom of the rung person at first level. I don't feel that is accurate, especially if we're going to be calling these kind of games heroic fantasy or high fantasy or what have you. Even at first level, you shouldn't be, you should be somebody who's a step a step above the rest, as part of the as part of that um, power fantasy. Even even 
even some even somebody like Conan that cer that certainly is applicable even in his earliest days but from oh, and yeah, yeah it is a bit generous but it's that disconnect that's kind of the issue here absolutely agree with that and uh, you know as somebody who's not only studied HEMA, um, you know, I did fencing for years as well. I did kendo and kenjutsu for years as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that really influenced how I went into looking at the martial combat in this, because there is a very, very big difference between doing a full body in overhead strike with a four foot length of steel and hitting somebody from the side as you move past them. They're physically more uh, different than you know some spells in reality would be um the impact and effect that it has on the body is radically different and you know there are almost no combat systems that i found that accounted for that you know they didn't account for the the effect of you know getting struck in the leg multiple times um you know what that would do to somebody they didn't account for you know the the, the change of force and velocity of, of someone doing a spinning sidekick into somebody's chest you know, and besides the, the, the one of the things you said earlier about it doesn't have to be a simulation. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and I think with, you know, fantasy combat, we don't need to be hyper realistic with the combat, but it also needs to feel real and it needs to feel different. You know, I swing my sword at it is not that's not how a trained fighter would fight. Nice. You know, somebody who's who's. I know, I know that some will say, "Well, just, well, just, ro just role play it." But it, you're less, you're less inclined to do that if, at the end of the day, you're still, ro you're, whether or not you're doing an overhand or whether or not you're doing a false edge or, or what have you, but it still amounts to the same basic attack. That's not going to incentivize you to go into that kind of detail with, with your role playing. Like if the only incentive that you get on that is the the pat on the head and maybe a couple extra exp at the end of the fight, that's no fun. That is no fun at all. But you know, being able to say, "Oh well, I'm going to chain these three techniques that I've got together, and that's going to translate into I'm going to I'm going to rush in with my rush technique, and that's going to give me an opening to to use my power attack, which will make my power attack more likely to hit. And then after I've hit with my power attack, I'm going to move away with my with my defensive stance. Like that's engaging. That's something that really draws in people. And suddenly, you know, you've got a whole combat loop where the player feels empowered. You as the GM have a very clear understanding of where everyone sits on the on the stage if you're doing just theater of the mind and you don't have minis on the table. And more importantly, you've got everybody else at the table really engaged because now suddenly there's a story mechanically behind every one of those moves. And you know, you've got the very real possibility that you know the 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 wizard that they were protecting in the back is like, oh well, you know, you can do all this, but now you've left me defenseless. Now I'm now I'm potentially can be attacked because the 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 enemy has a pole arm, and you know that changes the feeling of the fight. It makes it much more visceral, you know, especially because in in Prometheum the combat's not particularly lethal, right? You know, there's there's two layers of defense that you have. And so, you know, you're not, um, it's not like D&D &D where, you know, one hit from a goblin is going to kill your first level character with his max hit points regardless. Um, there's very much a chance that you'll, you'll get four or five hits before you're meaningfully in danger of dying. Um, but the counterpoint to that is, is that if the scale escalates, right, if you, if you take the combat up to the next level as a player, then as a GM, you can reciprocate. You know, you can suddenly have the enemies doing techniques, the enemies taking chances to do extra damage to them, right? You know, if you have the that one player who has maxed out their their agility score and their strength score, so they've got a ton of bonus dice on on agility and strength to hit and do damage, and they're going in and they're taking two chances on every single attack because they know they can beat that 35 vs, and they're just crushing enemies left and right. Well, then that's going to incentivize those enemies to do the exact same thing and step it up. And yeah, they're going to gamble with it. But if they hit, they might one shot that player. So it's kind of the, the balancing act that you get out of it. And you can't do that with just, oh, well, role play the move. You know, it's it's your fighter using, you know, fighter 
tactician ability, role play it. That doesn't that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, like, I don't I don't care for the idea of using mo role playing as a ba- as a bandage because that's basically what it is at that point. Right. Um, it's. If there's one thing that I've be, that I've begun to note, I've begun to notice more and more and more, it's the fact that I'm seeing a lot more people question why certain why certain mechanics or certain design ideas that have been standard, or or the idea that these things are what you have to do, are no longer are no longer looked at as that gospel that I mentioned. I'm not saying everybody's abandoning them, but I'm seeing more and more people go, why are we doing it like this? Right. It's the it's the inertia. It's the design inertia from something that was familiar to people. Right. You know, you see, you know, you were talking about the 90s and the skill games that had bazillions and bazillions of skills. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that emerged from a, a, a very specific time and place. And it became something that familiar that the players uh, and game masters and then eventually the designers who were themselves players and game masters were familiar with. Right. Um, but it was never really approached systematically. Um, and I so certainly don't think that anyone ever tried to look at like data um, to make database decisions on, you know, what players enjoyed and didn't enjoy. Um, and, you know, again, this is from my background in, in video games. This is something that we tried very hard to do is, you know, in addition to just people reporting what they enjoyed and didn't report enjoy and, and how they engaged with the system, you know, we wanted to look at where we were losing players' attention at the table. And so we would actually go through and watch the videos of our playtests. And, you know, when we noticed people were wandering off, we were like, there, what is that rule? What is that mechanism where our attention, the, the table's attention is drifting besides one or two people who are interacting? How do we stop that from happening? Um, and that does mean challenging conventions that exist in tabletop games. Um, not all of them, obviously, because I don't want the game to be completely and utterly unfamiliar to, to, to players, but there certainly was an earlier version of the Prometheum system that had a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, mechanisms and rules for play that really were not familiar or comfortable for players who were experienced tabletop players. Mm -hmm. And I know... I th- I think for a lot of people I think for a lot of people they got their start in the hobby stores got their start in the wargaming st- stores and th- and then crossed over into role playing games but over the over the last several decades you've had people you've had people who never never even touched a war game but got into role playing games yep and I th- is there is there a crossover still between the wargaming crowd and the role playing game crowd yes. But that, but that vent, but the central part of that Venn diagram is very small in the grand scheme of things. It's and much, it's shrinking. It's much, it's much like the Venn diagram between people who are fans of mixed martial arts and people who are fans of professional wrestling. <laughs> are there going to be people who enjoy both? Yes, I'm one of them. Granted, my professional wrestling enjoyment leans more into Japanese puro res. But that's another story. <laughs> look, I look, I, I got, I got my, I got my start in those tape trading days, wa- watching stuff from all Japan and Noah. So, that's my experience. No, I, I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like I've, I've talked about my love for Kento Kobashi and the insanity of of Great Muda and and others elsewhere. But the point, the point is, is, is that the way that war games have evolved and the way that tabletop RPGs have evolved are on two different particular wavelengths. Oh, definitely. And and they're definitely not heading in the same direction in my opinion. I mean, especially you look at, you know, the latest that's come out of say Games Workshop um, and you compare that to you know, the latest from WotC, you know, they're definitely not going in the same way. The funny thing about Games Workshop um, I a, f- a few years back I had um I had Graham Davis on the show. Oh wow! And he had he had brought some he had I had asked him about some of the early design days of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, 
And he had said that there was a very early version of it that was using the same D6 pool design as Warhammer Fantasy Battle was. But they ended up but they realized that they ended up writing themselves into a corner and blew the whole thing up and started fresh. And the and the results of that was the D one hundred based approach. The, now some of the some of the Warhammer stuff that Cubicle Seven uses is D six based, like Wrath and Glory is D six based, Age of Sigmar Soulbound is D six based. Um, but I don't think, but um, those don't use D six is the same way that the War Game did. Um, when I when Iron Kingdoms made the jump into making its own ga- into its own game. Um, it did. It doesn't play anything like the war game does. For better, I, uh, Iron Kingdom war game. Like I understand why people like it, but man, from a from a design standpoint, there were some challenges with that system. Um, I think I think this is also the reason why BattleTech has had a hard time venturing into the role playing game end of things, because it wants to insist on using the exact same. 2d6 approach that the war game does yeah and that that will it will never work i mean it it will never work and it won't work because especially you know with with battle tech their focus on strongly typed and strongly classed mechanics means that you can't account for non-comparables and player variables and situational modifiers like none of those, their system can't account for those, and that's the heart of action in role playing games. You know, the heart of action in role playing games, like at the end of the day, the reason that Baldur's Gate is such a pure reflection of, of playing D anD D is I'm going to transform into an owl barrel and jump off the rafters onto him. You know, like it's stuff like that. The the systems like the the war game rules for for BattleTech and and even for others like Warhammer, they can't account for it. They can't include that and use the same kind of resolution systems that they currently have. There's also the issue of a framing device. Mm, that's um, true. I've now I have played bo- I have played all three editions of Mech Warrior. I have played through BattleTech a Time of War and I've played Mech Warrior Destiny. And all of them are still operating under the assumption that you're a mercenary who's pi- who is piloting a mech. When <laughs> The, the the BattleTech universe is far too is far richer to bottleneck into just that, and you sh- even if mer- even if um mercenary is the is going to be the framing device, there's so many different ways you can take that beyond just being a mech warrior. And, and- the thing that really goads me is um, you know there's <sighs> there is so much that can be told about a world that has giant, you know, bipedal battle machines that are regularly fielded to do battle, right? There is so much narrative fuel there. Um, and as a framing device to unify players, I, I understand that it's important to have something that uh, can can bring players together. You know, one of the, one of the biggest problems that I think a lot of um, first-time GMs have is always how do we get the players together and how do we give them a reason to be working together in a sense of, of community and similarity. This is where in... the, you all meet in a tavern thing and I, I do want to contrast that with other with other games that have um, their own their own particular framing devices. L5R the there's a bunch of different ways you can frame it but the most popular way is you are all emerald magistrates. Yep, <laughs> we've all played that L five R game. <laughs> yeah, that it that is the easiest way to get to get people in. If you want to if you want to do something further, then then there's different ways. Dark Heresy, you are acolytes working under an Inquisitor, and that you are and working to further that Inquisitor's own goals, just with a degree of plausible deniability in case you fuck up, which you probably will. Oh yeah, and um. Exul- exalted, you have the whole thing of being demigods and ch- and chasing at, and one of the big framing devices you can use in that is chasing after um p- 
memories of your past incarnation. You know, going to going to what looks like what would normally be a dungeon in other games is actually a, is actually the tomb of the person you you were in a past age, kind that kind of thing. Um. Uh, and in um, Infinity, which is another case of jumping from miniature war game into um, RPG, you're an ad in, Infi in Infinity 2D20. You're an agent of um, O13, which is not far removed from like Section Nine in Ghost in Ghost in the Shell, in terms of, in terms of you are. You are part. You are part of the sphere's um, special operations when it comes to dealing with foreign and domestic threats. And there's a lot of ways that that can be taken. It also so you can have a bunch of people from diff from different backgrounds doing that kind of thing. Right. You've got a similar role, or uh, I don't want to say class, but like socio-political class that connects you and binds you, mm -hmm. and that's important. Yeah. The f I call I I refer to it as I'm pretty sure there's a better name than framing device, but that's what I'm going with until I can find something better. But I think it's important. I think it's important to have that. And of course, of course, the funny thing about L5R is the fact that it started out as a card game before making the before making the jump to role playing games, and it didn't even attempt to try and carry any of the mechanics from the card game into things. Thankfully. <laughs> if I'm being honest. Yeah, the the last thing anybody needs is is trying to figure out how to role play having all five rings and thus you win the game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the uh the you know going for a, going for an honor victory in a in a the L five R role playing game. Well possible I guess technically if you want to get real serious with it. Not gonna be a fun time. No. And it's it's one of those things that's ve that's very um, val that's very valuable is to have is to have that framing device that's I've seen a, I've seen a lot of fantasy anime doing this idea of adventuring being a profession with it with a guild who, that takes requests and I I think that's a framing device that should be embraced. Oh, I I cannot speak enough about how much the adventurers guild as a trope. And it, the funny thing is um, in my opinion, I think the the Eastern, I think these Eastern animes, they got it from the West um, because this is this is a trope that you know at least on the West Coast um, and the the elder gamers that I've played with on the West Coast, they've embraced. You know, the the adventuring guild was a was a long standard tradition of you know why you were an adventurer and how you make money as an adventurer. Um, and in my opinion, I think it is possibly the best new fantasy trope to come out of anything in the last 20 years. Because now when I tell players, um, you know, congratulations, you're an adventurer, you're going to go to the Adventurer's Guild and you're going to get your, your Adventurer's Badge, it justifies why they're out in the fantasy world doing a thing. It justifies who's paying and who's footing the build for these, these you know, dungeon delves and these, um, these misadventures. Um, and more importantly, it gives the players a really strong sense of connection and community to something that doesn't even really exist, but suddenly they feel like, you know, oh, well, there's other adventurers too. In which, I don't know about you, but when I was first playing D&D, like, the adventurers felt like, you know, they were the only ones in the world sometimes. Um, whereas with with this concept of the guild and including, including that as a, as a narrative foil and, uh, as you like to say, framing device for, um, you know, players... Uh, as a profession, I think it's great. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, not going to lie, it's something that I'm including in stuff and it's going to be a, a thing that I rest on uh, for a lot of the, the future fantasy work that I do. I will note that I ended up taking one, I ended up taking things one step further. Yeah. Uh, with, with one of my, with one of the projects that I might, tr that I intend on conver converting into, um, Either a setting book, or even, or even just a zine that somebody could slot into their own into their campaigns. Is if we're if we're going to have a guild, why not why not have a full on adventuring school? We've seen that concept in in manga throughout, and 
my co right. my co-writer Zan and I um, created the concept of Agito Arcanum, which is basically a a pro a school that was a school that was made by a small group of legendary adventurers to give people the proper tools to actually do it without getting themselves killed and give and um giving it giving a giving a natural path between getting say get, getting scouted but getting scouted into the school learning to be an adventurer proper in whatever form that takes to joining the guild and taking on jobs as as a um tenured adventurer i absolutely love it that is um one of the one of the homebrew games that I've got that will eventually get turned into a, into a thing for uh, for the Prometheum system is I had a uh, a setting called the Gilgamesh Professional Adventurers Academy, um, and I actually would run the players as they joined the school to become adventurers and experienced you know adventurer training um, with all the the hijinks that you can imagine from something that's like thirty percent high school drama and you know. 60% chaotic hijinks dungeon delves. Um, but I, I love that as a concept and as a as a narrative foil because, you know, when we look at these worlds holistically, it makes no sense that there wouldn't be, right? I mean, if the first school of accounting opened up in 800 BC in Athens, then by all accounts, you know, there would be in a world sophisticated enough to have you know global trade and a complex system of magic they would have schools for this they would have academies for this you know they would take people who you know were willing to take on these dangerous somewhat suicidal jobs professionally uh you know they would have a mechanism to to police and control as well as a credit and hold them accountable um because that's one of the things that i think people seem to miss is Adventurers would be held accountable for their wrongdoings too. You know, they wouldn't just get a free pass because, oh, you're an adventurer, so we'll look the other way. Yeah, and when I, when I've done this kind of thing, there's there's always been the, um, there's there's always been the approach that you you're get there's a lot of benefits that you're getting. You're get you can you can get room and board in certain in certain places. You will be able to access certain equipment. Um, Certain governments are not going to um, give you the side eye because you have because you have because you have a bunch of magic items on you because there's an understanding I need these to actually do my job. Um, you're you know you'll you know get being able to make those kind of connections and, and so on, just so long as you don't do anything fucking stupid. <laughs> um, so oh, that's always the challenging one, huh? <laughs> well. Some people test it, and then and then they le they learn the hard way that when I when I say you have these benefits on on the condition that you don't do anything stupid, and then they do something stupid, and then they find out the good old fat. Good old. Because I've I've had to I've had to deal with that on on occasion when somebody when somebody who had played murder hobos at at in the past and then plays um L five R with me. And then they they decided to do the whole how much how much XP do I get for killing the NPC? Except they just did that in di in daylight, and now now they're get and now they're be now one of the other people who knows better is like I I am ch I am challenging you to an AI jutsu duel, and the and they end up getting their ass kicked and pro and probably lose their head in the process. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that was one of the ways that I liked to tame murder hobo players. It's like, oh, we're, we're playing a samurai game now, guys. Uh, I had a, I had a sim, I had a similar thing happen the first time I played Lex Arcana with people, which Lex Arcana is a very fascinating game. I will note that. Um, but I had specifically informed people, do not make a combat heavy character. Do not think of this as Gladiator. Think of this as more akin to the X Files. And one person did, and everybody gave him shit for it because he didn't get the memo. <laughs> can you make a combat heavy character? Can you make a combat leaning character in Lex Arcana? Yes, but it's important. But it's important to keep in mind that 
that game heavily leans towards investigation. Yeah, it's it, it's. It would be it would be like trying to make a combat heavy character in a gumshoe game. <laughs> uh, you know, was there ever a Dick Tracy game? I I remember thinking there was one, but I don't. I, I don't see it now that I'm looking. To my not to. I'm not going to say that there wasn't, but to my knowledge, no. I am, I am not I'm not ruling out the possibility that somebody did a fan-made Dick, Dick Tracy game at some point. Uh, there's a non-zero chance of that, and I could easily see somebody doing that in, say, Gumshoe or D6. Um, yeah, it would work pretty well in... in... The Gumshoe, wouldn't it? Well, it's well. Gumshoe was pretty much made for investigative ca um, style. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's the that's the thing. Whenever I whenever I bring up games to people, I always treat it like I'm like I'm a tailor. Like it's not a case of is this game good or bad. It's who would I recommend this to, and how easily could I recommend it. That makes sense. And it depends on what kind of game you want. You know, mm -hmm. what you're going to be doing, what your players want, you know, who your players are. That and not really every depends. game is going, to, is going to work for every um, play style. Um, oh, Sav no, definitely. Savage Worlds works very good for pulpy affairs. But if somebody wants something a little more granular, I tell them to go somewhere else. I have many issues with Savage Worlds. I'll, I'll leave that on the table, but you're right. I think if, if you want pulp action right and you don't really want to think too hard about it savage world is definitely a place to go well its tagline in the early days was fast furious fun and i'm not i'm not going to yeah. hold it against the, i'm not going to hold it against them for commit for committing to the bit <laughs> that, that's true i can't argue with that i i didn't know that that was one of their original taglines yeah you would see it all the you would see it all the time on on their um on their marketing, on their logos, and the like, and in that in that same in that same vein, um, if somebody if somebody wants to if somebody wants to do something that's a little bit more street level supers, I'm not going to put them I'm not going to point them in the direction of champions. Um, I'd probably put them in the direction of say hit the streets, defend the block, which is specifically built for street level style supers. Yep. Oh, uh, maybe if you wanted to punish them, you could also point them to Heroes Unlimited. I, <laughs> I feel like if I did that, I would get dragged in front of the Geneva Accords for torturing non-combatants. <laughs> <laughs> Heroes Unlimited is another one of those cases of I will not touch that again unless I'm getting paid. You know, the thing that just amuses me the most about Heroes Unlimited is of all of the... The thing that I love about Palladium is that it tries to do all these different genres. And some of them it does brilliantly well. Some of them it doesn't do very well. And I gotta hand it, the combat rules for Palladium could absolutely deliver for superheroes. I really do believe that. But... And the power scaling of the system exists, right? It can handle the big numbers and the the, the huge effects that you kind of want from a from a grandiose superhero. But man, the power system that Symbedia came up with, that is not that is definitely not how I would have done that. No. Now one of the final things I do I do want to bring bring up, and I'm I am going to be dancing around a, a bit because one that one there's an one I don't want to cause any trouble, but I did say I was going to I was going to tackle this. You've gotten a lot of attention after that announcement that you're going to be doing you're going to be doing RPGs that were tied into um, both East and the Trails of Cold Steel series um, part part of the leg the Legend of Heroes series because obviously Trails of Cold Steel is just one part of a much bigger. Um, set up that's been around for quite a lot longer but correct the, one there's a there's i can i'm assume i'm assuming 
that this is still going to be using the Prometheum system that you've established through Curse Brand and through Ep and through Epic Age. Yes, so it's it's going to be using the same basic mm -hmm. resolution mechanics for it. Obviously, there are some tweaks and some upgrades and some changes that are coming to the system, but um, that's kind of how we're treating all of the books in the Prometheum system. Is is you know each book is more time for us to refine the system, and so we're going to iterate and update um, and keep doing that rollingly, keeping the same kind of resolution mechanics. Yeah. But yeah, they're going to use versions of the Prometheum system. Uh, I will I will admit that. Trails, def Trails has a ha definitely already has a proper framing device to build a cast of characters around. With East, that that makes that is going to be a little bit trickier because you end up having what what um I've nicknamed the Jedi problem. <laughs> yep, everyone wants to be Jedi. Um, did you ever play Star Wars Galaxies? Uh, no, no, I totally didn't. Which, that was an interesting beast. But Ralph Koster, who I always recommend people read his Theory of Fun book, book um, he did not want Jedi in Star Wars Galaxies. Refu refused, th refused to put them in for as long until he was forced to do so. And his reasoning for that was he felt Jedi would become an alpha class that everybody would want to chase. And given that Star Wars Galaxies was a sandbox-style MMO, much like, say, EVE or RuneScape or, RuneScape or EverQuest or the like, you know, where everybody's taking organic jobs, uh, that would end up screwing with the game's internal economy. It was likely wrong, mm -hmm. but, you know, one of my biggest complaints about that is this goes back to, you know, narrative foil and structure. Like, for a big sandbox game like that um maybe just maybe star wars isn't the universe for that type of design but hey that's just my opinion it it worked fairly well until he was forced to put in Je to put in jedi and even then he right. tried to make it difficult which lasted about a week but <laughs> with something like e the east games have largely focused on adol they have and the, and this is this is why I like I liken the this whole thing to the Je to the Jedi problem, because obviously nope, not obviously not everybody can be a dull Christian. So so do you guys have plans on on develop on developing some degree of a framing device to to have a variety of characters within that universe? I'm not asking for specifics. Just is that part of the plan. Absolutely. And you know also something that I can get into specifics on. Um, you know, one of the big things that we looked at when we were making this game and when we actually pitched it to Neon Falcon was that we wanted to tell the story of what the world became because of Adol's adventures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Adol was in a very real sense the very first adventurer in this world. Um, he received the title of adventurer from one of the the, the Eldeen, these demigods uh, that exist in the world. Um, and, you know, he used that as his moniker after the fact and coined these journals of his, of his exploits and explorations. Hmm. Um, and so we wanted to kind of capture, you know, what, what happens after a world has gotten a taste of adventure. Um, and that's why we, we had the subtitle for it, uh, Age of Heroes. Um, because that's what it's really about. It's about an age where, you know, people have heard of Adol's adventures, they've realized that there's a big world to explore and things have changed. And so, you know, they set out to become, um, you know, members of that kind of community of adventurers. And, you know, we actually talked about the Adventurers Guild before. That's actually something that we specifically feature in uh, Age of Heroes. Um, you know, being an adventurer in Age of Heroes means being a member of the Adventurers Guild, and you know, being a part of that um, community of heroes that then kind of exists into this world that has been—I don't want to say turned upside down, but definitely changed by the passing of what was, you know, really the first adventurer who who uncovered all of these plots and these mysteries and these magics um, and changed the course of of history. 
Uh, and so that's kind of how we've been approaching that, um, like you said, that framing. Um, because one, it it fits the genre, right? The thing that Yeast is, is genre defining and trope ingesting. You know, they were some of the first action RPGs ever to be made. And one of the things that they did is have all of these things that we take for granted in fantasy anime and fantasy uh, uh, Japanese media. And they took it, they took it seriously, they took it lighthearted. And every iteration of the East games thereafter have had some of those tropes and some of those um, things that, you know, you take for granted in fantasy uh, anime and leaned into them and just believed in them. And so that's one of the things we wanted to do is, you know, lean into that and kind of believe in it. Now, of course, the 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 other th the other thing is that, given given the class system that you have, and the and the fact that throughout throughout a lot of the East games, you have Adel as somebody who can dip into both martial and magical skills, skills, abilities, arts, whichever whichever you want to call it. That's not that's not important, but. Do you in, do you intend on ma on maintaining a class based design, or do you intend on going semi classless with um, with the setup with ease, or is that not something you can go into right now? Um, I actually, speak to that a little bit. Um, we do have a class system, um, and in fact, we actually have uh, two class mechanics. Um, a new mechanic that we're we've talked about in some of the previous books, but we haven't printed anything, which is called elite classes. Um, and then we've got you know your core classes that you can kind of select at first level. Um, one of the things that we wanted to really lean into was exactly what we just talked about. You know, Adol, he's the exception that proves the rule in many cases. He gets magical artifacts from powerful semi-deatific entities and then can use magic. Um, and then that usually goes away at some point in time. Um, but one of the things that we really wanted to capture and one of the things that was so good about the Prometheum system for, you know, yeast specifically, was that where you start with your character is not where you end. Um, unlike D&D, where if you start as a fighter, you've got the fighter train, and then that's it. That's what you've got. Um, with the Prometheum system, you can start out as a fighter and then specialize all in nothing but magical skills. And, you know, by 10 levels, have nothing but, you know, magical capabilities. Um, that's something that you can absolutely do with um, the Prometheum system, which a, a strongly typed class-based game can't do. You know, the Prometheum system, we, we even talked about this earlier, about games that kind of seem like class games, but were really skill games. Prometheum doesn't pretend to be a class-based game. It's a skill-based game. Mm -hmm. Your starting class is just a way for you to get directly into making a hero. Uh rather than the way to define and grow your hero. And that's one of the things that we wanted to lean to. The original version of the premium system didn't even have classes. It was actually a classless system. Um, but players didn't like that. You know, I talked about using data and using uh, playtests to make design decisions. And after playtesting, we found that a lot of people talk a big game about how they love classless systems, and that's their go-to. And then... Everybody bitched about not having classes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the things we wanted to lean into was having the having the kind of historic occupations uh, that you see represented in the East games, mm -hmm. and seeing how you could turn those into uh, the seeds of heroism um, and the seeds of you know epic characters. Uh, because, like Adol himself, he starts as a swordsman uh, from a farming village. Right, and then he becomes a hero through his skill and his trials and his talent with swordsmanship, and that talent with swordsmanship eventually earns him the title of adventurer, um, and he becomes you know so much more than that after the fact. Um, and I think that's an important thing that we wanted to capture was that yeah you know you start as a herbalist, but where you end up is maybe something radically different. You know maybe you'll go into an elite class and become an alchemist. Or maybe you won't, and you'll just take a bunch of skills, and you'll end up as you know a, a master of something even far more interesting and esoteric. Um, it's up to you as you grow your character. Mm -hmm. Now, to shift that into um, Trails of Cold Steel, 
there when it comes to the framing device i'd i'd say that that's a, that has a little bit of an easier setup the obviously the games the one of the big framing devices was um cl was class 7 of the thor's military academy i mean that that's that's part that's part of the story within that within that game and everything that goes from that within within tra within trails are are you using things things like military things like students of military academy as part of the framing device within within that entry or again again if it's something you can't go into detail feel, feel free to let me know <laughs> so i can talk about some of it some of it is the world of trails is huge it is there is so much material there um, and there is so much that we want to be able to capture. And the, tra the Trail series covers multiple countries across the entire continent of Zemiria, and it features frames for the, the players in different regions, in different settings, for different reasons, but all of them kind of connected by this large you know, geopolitical conflict that's happening. So we're actually doing away with some of the framing stuff um, for the Trails game. And we're actually opening it up a little bit. You could play characters who are all members of the, like you said, Class 7 or one of the other their classes um, at Thor's Academy. Or perhaps you have characters who are all members of the Bracers organization. Um, perhaps none of the above. Um, the framing situation for... For trails is going to be a little bit more fluid and not as singular and written into the book as it is in most of our other games. Um, it's going to be a little bit closer to um, you know how you see it in other traditional RPGs. With you know it's kind of up to the game master to decide, the players and game masters to decide for their campaign. Um, for the adventure that we're writing for it, it will be included. The the framing bias will be included for the for the players, um, but it is not going to be quite as hard and fast um and there's going to be lots of different ways to connect them i should say mm -hmm. now i think one of the other things is you you mentioned with kurt with curse brand one of it one of its key mechanics was heavily drawn was heavily inspired by um the materia setup in final fantasy 7 and of course the trails series has had you know c concepts like or concepts like orbments and the and um and the Ar the um Arcus thing mm -hmm. and I'm cu I'm curious I'm curious if some of the things that you had developed with Curse Brand are going to be refined into so into something that's analogous to that system. Um, I wouldn't even say analogous. We're we're actually working on the rules right now for the full and orbit system. Um, we need okay by necessity. We need to simplify an orbit system for a tabletop game. I'm sure you can understand. Nobody has a computer with them to run the complexity that exists in the video game orbit system. Yes. Um, so it is it is important for us to capture the feeling of customizing your orbment and gaining your orbment abilities. Um, but it is also far more important that we are practical and understand the challenges that players have. You know, one of the things we need to get away from is making sure that the orbment doesn't become uh, an hour and a half character creation uh, sink, and it doesn't become something unmanageable during play. Um, the important thing is that it, it's got to be fun to play and continue playing with and be able to to upgrade and understand without it being uh, bothersome. Um, so we're definitely looking at ways to combine those systems. You know, Right now, we're working on some of the more core mechanisms for it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine, that means taking time, looking at data, doing versions, seeing how those versions look. Um, but we really do want to capture... The full feeling of having the the ornaments, you know, the arts and the crafts, um, and that will be reflected in the names. We already basically have those built into the Prometheum system anyway. We've already got the resources to manage. We've already got the concept of of the crafts with our techniques. 
um, you know, we, we're going to be able to use arts with the basic magic system. So it's it's going to be there, and I think players are going to both recognize it, and fans of the series are going to recognize it and have a lot of fun with it. Mm-hmm. And I will I will certainly be looking forward to it. I know I know that you opened up um, playtesting, and I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to ask it as far as far as a date because I know that those kind of things are in flux. But I will be I will be keeping a close eye on how, on how that sort of thing develops, and on my on my own time and in my own particular way particular way. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure, man. I really did enjoy it today. Yeah. And. Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>